so thank you. Uh, I'm Sandra Stars. I'm a, a professor here at Scalia Law, and I'm very excited to uh, have the opportunity to moderate this panel because I wanted to hear them speak anyway. So I have the honor of sitting up here with them. Um, we have with us today um, Justin Gus Hurwitz. Uh, he is uh, going to speak first. He's assistant professor of law and co-director of space, cyber, and telecom law program at the University of Nebraska College of Law. Um, seated next to him is Stuart Baker. He's a partner at Steptoe and Johnson. Um, he will uh, speak second. Um, then our discussants today are Brenda Long. Uh, she's senior counsel and director of strategy um, at the Future of Privacy Forum. And uh, next to her is Alan Butler. And he is senior privacy counsel at the Electronic Privacy Information Center and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center. Um, so I will, uh, without any further comments, uh, turn it over to Gus to get us started. OK, um, thank you. Uh, I'm going to be speaking a bit about the sharing economy and why it is awesome. Then uh, hand things over to Stuart, uh, who will talk a bit about uh, Internet of Things and security and other stuff, and maybe who knows what I'll talk about. Uh, and we're all gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll. we'll uh, I'll just start by noting that we actually have a bit of a sharing economy thing going on uh, up here on the table, since between the two of us we have one microphone, and between uh, uh, Alan and Brenda they have one microphone. Uh, so uh, we're we're already on board with the idea that the sharing economy is a good thing. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, my goal with uh, my, my app says you're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my goal with my uh, introductory comments uh, is not necessarily to stake out a strong position so much as to uh, discuss a bit about what the sharing economy is, how uh, I think about it, how uh, uh, some of us think about it, and why it is potentially awesome, and also to lay out some of the concerns that uh, we'll get into over the course of uh, uh, the discussion. Um, so what is the sharing economy? Well, best uh, uh, known examples, if we want to uh, start by talking through examples, uh, Uber, Lyft, Airbnb. Other uh, uh, sharing apps uh, um, examples, arguably Kickstarter and eBay, are examples of sharing economy uh, services that are well known, uh, high market cap uh, uh, ventures. Um, then we have things like uh, pet sitting, uh, microfinance, house cleaning and yard work, uh, handyman services. What do all these have in common? Uh, these are consumer to consumer ish sort of business-ish sort of ventures that are intermediated, facilitated primarily by cell phone-based uh, apps. So I want to uh, uh, have someone come pick me up in a car and drive me somewhere. Some other consumer out there has a car that they're not currently using. They're happy to uh, uh, spend 10 minutes giving me a ride. I'm happy to give them 10 bucks for it. We use a cell phone to intermediate and facilitate this transaction. Um, uh, so the overarching defining characteristic of um, sharing economy applications is these are uh, uh, platforms that are built around low transaction cost communications that allow individuals to act like businesses. Uh, I sometimes think of this as consumer to consumer business. Um, generally, we think about this in terms of consumers sharing access to their capital assets, excess capacity with other consumers. So I have an empty bedroom in my house. Airbnb, the original idea wasn't, hey, I'm going to start up a small hotel chain. It's, I have a bedroom in my house. It would be great if I could rent that out for a couple hundred dollars a month uh, to people who need low price accommodations or for whatever reason uh, might not want to stay in a hotel. Um, that's the sharing component of the sharing economy. I have some asset and I am sharing access to it. Um, one interesting question to frame up uh, that I think we'll come back to over the course of um, uh, uh, the panel is, is the sharing economy a cause or an effect of people trying to share these assets? What do I mean with that? Uh, by that, um, do we have Airbnb and Uber because some innovator somewhere said, you know what, this is a brilliant idea I can create an app that's going to allow people to rent out for short periods uh, their uh, uh, extra bedrooms, 
or is it something inevitable as uh, uh, transaction costs fall that people who have spare bedrooms are going to say, hey, it would be a great way for me to make some extra money if I could let these out to folks who need short-term accommodations, and the platforms uh, uh, arise because of that. So uh, this framing echoes some of Todd's comments in the previous panel asking um, about supply and demand. Um, is uh, do, are these services creating new supply? Are they creating a new product, some new thing that's being put out into the market, or are they satiating an existing demand? Why is this important? It's important because if what they're doing is satiating an existing demand, if we are concerned about these um, uh, services, these platforms, and we try to regulate them, what do we expect to happen? Well, the demand is still there. So the demand will go to less efficient uh, platforms. It will go to uh, black market, or perhaps, depending on your perspective, more black market um, uh, platforms uh, uh, to facilitate these transactions. So what's the um, economic theory of uh, the sharing economy? So on the supply side, it's putting what we call slack resources to productive use. A slack resource, I have some asset that due to whatever transaction costs, whatever uh, market friction there is, I can't fully capitalize. I can't fully make up use of in the market. So uh, uh, on the supply side, I can't get money from people who want to sit in my passenger seat while I drive them from point A to point B. I can't let out my room. Uh, I can't, to use another example, on my private jet as I fly from uh, uh, Chicago to Lincoln, um, not how I travel, just so you know. Um, I have an empty seat, an extra seat. I can't uh, uh, find someone who wants to pay uh, uh, 400 bucks to take that seat um, for me. Um, on the demand side, uh, it's reducing search costs. It's facilitating um, buyers' ability to find sellers uh, to uh, engage in these transactions. On both sides, one of the common uh, um, features that we see in sharing economy applications is it's information forcing about quality. And this is quality along a wide range of dimensions. Um, the best known example is the, uh, both the driver and the passenger rating on Uber. Drivers get to uh, rate passengers. Passengers get to uh, rate drivers. And this helps both passengers and drivers make decisions about who they want to interact with. Um, and on both sides, um, it facilitates lower value transactions than would have been previously possible in the market. So we can think of the sharing economy um, in a sense as the long tail of economic activity. Generally, we have all of this really long tail of potential transactions that are too low value for the market to ordinarily facilitate, so it's not going to facilitate them. The sharing economy is a way to make a market there to bring a willing buyers and sellers together. Other things that the sharing economy market does, it grows the market. And it does this in a couple of different ways. So the most obvious way, it brings in competition against uh, uh, existing market participants. So uh, Airbnb, I'm using the, the best known examples because they're best known, uh, obviously. Airbnb competes uh, to some extent with traditional hotels. Um, it's a short-term uh, stay accommodation market. Um, uh, Uber competes with uh, taxi cabs. Um, it also has other effects, though. It adds a new range, a new class of uh, products into the market. So we have product differentiation, both at the higher and lower quality uh, end of the market. So uh, for some uh, uh, folks, they might want to find accommodations that are much cheaper than the typical hotel uh, would make available. You come to DC and you say, I can't afford $250 a night for a hotel. My university is only going to cover $80 a night. What am I going to do? Well, you find uh, sometimes uh, an Airbnb, um, or you demand more money. Um, uh, on the higher end, sometimes you want uh, something that is more akin to a short-term house rental. Um, so you uh, um, are going to turn to that instead of uh, the hotel. So examples of uh, uh, this, well, the best known example, especially for those of us in DC, um, uh, Uber has dramatically increased the quality of uh, cab service in most parts of the country. Um, uh, two, three years ago in DC, 
finding a cab was a nightmare, and even worse, they'd only take cash. Um, now the taxi cab experience has dramatically improved. Other effects, um, low-income individuals are able to get into the market. So if you have a car, you're able to uh, start capitalizing that and turning it into money. Um, uh, lower transaction costs for finding all sorts of contractors. I've been focusing on Airbnb and Uber, but what we see in uh, many markets uh, is uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, other sharing economy sorts of services are starting to come uh, into play for finding ordinary uh, household services. How big are these markets? Well, Uber uh, uh, is about a $50 billion market cap, Airbnb about a $30 billion market cap, and those are just the two largest of these companies. Um, so sounds good, so what? Uh, why are we uh, up here to complain about something or what are we complaining about? Uh, well, some really evil, terrible people out there want to shut down the sharing economy. Um, why is this? Um, so the, the story that we're mostly concerned about is a traditional uh, one of captured regulators and uh, licensed oligopoly. Um, uh, so who opposes, let's stick with Uber, well, taxicab unions. They have uh, been decimated. Their profits uh, have gone down dramatically. Their drivers are facing substantial competition. And they're being forced to spend money uh, investing uh, uh, to upgrade uh, the quality of their uh, rides. So the traditional story um, at times, so I'm going to wrap this up quickly, and we'll get into uh, uh, this more, I'm sure. Um, the, the traditional story here is government regulators give uh, preferred professions licenses to create barriers of, to entry to keep com competition out. Why do they do that? Because these barriers to entry allow that market to be a cartel and extract super competitive profits. Well, why are the regulators going to let the taxi cabs extract these uh, super competitive profits? Because it gets cycled back into the political process through lobbying, political contributions, and what's not. So we've seen myriad efforts um, to uh, try and stop and regulate various uh, sharing activity, uh, sharing economy services. Um, and going back to that point that I made echoing uh, uh, Todd's comments earlier, what we tend to see is when this happens, the demand is still there. So uh, as uh, the most famous example probably is when Austin, uh, Texas, tried to ban Uber. What happened? Within a week, we started seeing a large number of uh, non-Uber ride-sharing apps that the, the city couldn't keep track of coming into the market, which had even greater problems than the city was concerned about and those who are concerned about uh, the sharing economy uh, concerns uh, had. So, the demand is there. Let's not uh, try and stifle that. Great. Thank you, Gus. Um, now we'll uh, hear from Stuart about the Internet of Things. OK, yes, from uh, uh, the vast sunny uplands to the dark and dismal swamp of uh, cybersecurity and the Internet of Things. Um, uh, I should say, uh, I should have included in this in my bio, but I also have a weekly podcast. So if you like this uh, um, gloomy uh, uh, perspective <laughs> on the world, you can get it every week. Uh, it, uh, and as I tell people, it's, it's public policy you can rake leaves to, which is not, not easy to find. Um, Sometimes he has me on as a guest. Yes, I, and, and I am going to ask you how it is you p shifted from such a millennial friendly name as Justin to such a sort of 1940s name as <laughs> Gus. Uh, so tune in the next time Gus is on. We're going to find out the facts. Uh, uh, so let me, let me uh, uh, jump in on this. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about Internet of Things cybersecurity regulation in the context of the paper, but also in the context of why I am gradually coming to believe that uh, regulating cybersecurity uh, for the Internet of Things makes sense, and I'll try to do that in the terms of the paper. Um, the first question that you have to ask is not, is the regulation a good idea, but is there some kind of market failure? Are there some externalities? Uh, that uh, uh, the market is not capturing. And I think that's pretty clear. Um, in fact, I would argue that hackers who are looking to exploit cybersecurity flaws are in the market themselves for market failure. They're looking for people whose 
stake in cybersecurity is less than the folks that they actually want to attack. If you want to get to Target, which is locked up its uh, credit card numbers uh, tight, you go to their HVAC provider, compromise the HVAC comp uh, uh, provider's uh, uh, computers, and then use his connection to Target to get into Target's system. Um, and um, Internet of Things is full of that uh, uh, kind of thing. If you bought a, uh, uh, a quote-unquote security camera uh, that was Internet connected, uh, uh, you might be getting exactly what you paid for, which is pictures of your front door or your backyard. Uh, meanwhile, that computer is also, that, that um, camera is also uh, uh, doing a denial of service attack on some party that uh, 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 the uh, uh, hackers who took over the security camera want to uh, uh, extort funds from. Uh, and as far as you're concerned, you're getting exactly what you paid for and no problems. And uh, from the point of view of the attacked party, uh, given the massive numbers of these internet connected uh, things, uh, it's almost impossible to defend against. That's clearly an externality and a market failure. Uh, um, I would argue it might be worse than that. No one yet has demonstrated a way to deliver cybersecurity without um, uh, providing updates to the software, the firmware, sometimes the hardware, uh, in response to new attacks that are developed. So one of the things that's quite clear in this field is there's no way for a device to be absolutely secure when it is first marketed because the people who designed it and wrote the software do not have the imagination or even the personality necessary to find all the flaws in that device. And they're going to have to respond when somebody discovers a new attack by updating the device. Uh, and yet, uh, if you are in the Internet of Things business, um, you just want software that gets the thing online and delivers the data, and you don't care very much uh, whether it's the most recent and most recently patched uh, uh, software, and you certainly don't want to provide for a mechanism by which you will constantly be researching possible attacks on your device and updating it. You know, you only got five bucks for the devi device wholesale, so you're not going to uh, invest heavily in updating devices that you've already sold. So I think there is a built-in uh, failure, um, a, and some of these built-in failures are fatal, uh, literally. Uh, uh, St. Jude uh, was the subject of a, uh, uh, a security research report that said, wow, you know, uh, um, the security on your uh, heart uh, implants is so bad that somebody could actually go in uh, and uh, take over the device and start administering shocks uh, until the uh, person with the implant died. Uh, um, and various updates have been released sort of slowly over the last year. And now doctors are being, uh, are, are, are starting to say, well, nobody's died yet. I'm not sure I'm going to recommend any updates. Uh, a, 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 and what that shows is doctors are very smart in their field, but maybe not in cybersecurity. But again, the, the lack of uh, information and updates where they need to be suggests that there's a need in the market for some additional uh, action or guidance. Uh, the second usual question in this area is, um, are we going to stifle innovation? If you're going to regulate technology, there is always a risk that you're going to be stifling uh, uh, innovation. Uh, and I, uh, there's no doubt that that's a risk in this area, just as in others. Um, but I, I note that uh, uh, technology has a life cycle all its own. Uh, it, begins by transforming things in dramatic fashion. Uh, the way we live, um, uh, uh, trains, 
automobiles, electricity, all had that impact uh, uh, over 100 years ago. But gradually, uh, the extent to which changes in the technology continue to transform the world uh, uh, diminish. And you have less and less revolutionary changes. Uh, uh, Moore's Law has had a really good run uh, uh, changing the world, but it's starting to run up against real limitations. And in fact, the latest meltdown specter bugs s suggest that we've been making Moore's Law work mainly by cheating, uh, uh, by doing speculative execution, uh, which is not exactly making the hardware better though it does make for faster performance, but at a cost in terms of cybersecurity. And what that raises, I think, is at what point do you say, OK, we've seen a lot of innovation. There's probably more to come. But uh, we're probably at the point where uh, we know more or less what sorts of innovations we're going to get uh, from uh, a particular technology. Uh, um, you know, if, if the coolest thing that has happened in the last five years is messages with 140 characters, you're probably on your last legs in terms of, of innovation. Uh, <laughs> so um, a, I'm not convinced that uh, we aren't at a point where we can tell more or less what this technology is doing, more or less how much innovation we're going to see and where it's going to go. And so we can probably afford to be a little more interested in um, uh, providing regulatory guidance. Um, the other objection, and I think this continues to be a very plausible objection, is that the pace of change is too fast uh, uh, for regulation to keep up. And there was, a, uh, I thought, the best point in the paper on Internet of Things was the quite accurate observation, first, that the Innovators in this market are the hackers, the attackers, the people who are trying to break into the systems. They innovate. Two years later, cybersecurity providers come up with uh, innovations of their own to respond to that. Two years after that, the market wakes up and says, hey, I need that, don't I? Uh, and about two years after that, uh, the people in charge of compliance say, oh, yeah, we, we should require that. Um, so you're always going to have a lag in terms of uh, implementing uh, uh, your, uh, uh, your security measures. I, that's true. Um, I would make this observation. It is very rare. It does happen, but it is very rare for a cybersecurity measure once it becomes necessary to cease becoming, uh, being necessary. That is to say, uh, even if what you're doing is requiring people to do stuff that they should have done five years ago, um, doesn't mean they shouldn't be doing it. It just means that you're not going to completely solve the problem with uh, regulations that are five years out of date. Uh, and so that argues that if there are people who haven't done the things that are in the regulations, they have put themselves at risk uh, and probably others as well. And therefore, action ought to be taken. Um, it's also possible, of course, to write regs that are not prescriptive, you must do this. The, the NIST cybersecurity framework uh, doesn't tell you exactly what to do. It tells you where to look and what to think about. Uh, and regs of that kind, I think, can uh, be made to work. Uh, um, last point that I will raise before turning this over is uh, cartelization, regulatory capture, oligopolistic behavior uh, create, essentially created by uh, the regulations themselves. And uh, there is no doubt that that would happen if you started to regulate uh, in the Internet of Things. Uh, um, I think we would have to embrace the idea that, uh, yeah, we're raising the cost of those security cameras substantially so that the people who are selling them can actually afford to do the sorts of monitoring and updates that uh, are necessary to protect everybody. Uh, um, and uh, that is a cost. You have just have to decide whether you're prepared to pay that cost. Uh, how many people here have iPhones? OK, so you've already decided you're willing to pay 25% more than the product's worth. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 so it's, it is not the end of the world. Uh, it, it, economists hate it when there's cartelization using regulatory capture. But it isn't the end of the world. It just uh, uh, makes for a, a less efficient uh, uh, market. And if the, that's the price you have to pay to be protected from sort of catastrophic attacks on uh, um, uh, cardiac implants, probably worthwhile. Thanks. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, Brenda. 
Good morning. Thank you very much to uh, the Mason Law and Economics Center and the Journal for Law and Economic Policy for inviting me to be here today. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, you never quite know when these panels uh, happen and you get invited to be on them sometimes exactly what voice you're supposed to be on that panel. And so I'm always interested to try to figure out what position I'm representing. And it was a little more confusing today than sometimes, since in fact there are a lot of points of agreement uh, with the Future Privacy Forum and some of the things that we do and a lot of the points being made. But then I think there's also plenty of room for uh, interpretive disagreement on the best way to move forward in some of these areas. So um, just as uh, Gus and Stuart split the discussion between a sharing economy and IoT, Alan and I, I'm going to respond primarily to the sharing economy issues, and Alan's going to talk more about IoT. So I'm going to leave aside some of the um, very valid cybersecurity points that Stuart just made um, and go back to uh, Gus's worldview which uh, I would generally align with that presented in the paper as the um, all sunshine and ponies of young uh, entrepreneurs looking to share their passenger seat in their spare bedroom and the opportunity to do that versus the overregulated, um, antiquated, captured uh, industries of taxicab medallions and um, hotels. Um, I would not actually probably want to live in either one of those worlds, and I think, in fact, ours is a little bit more nuanced and complicated than that. Um, the paper itself, just to focus on that for a minute for anybody who might have read it in, in preparation for this, um, it talks about the role of, of regulation, and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, um, and how that might look. And one of the interesting things I found from it is that it didn't seem to like either model of regulation, which potentially, I guess, leaves us with the option of none. The FTC's role has traditionally been, um, at least in the last few decades, since its mandate was changed somewhat, is a, a more reactive, responsive, um, but potentially more flexible enforcer of general standards such as unfair and misleading practices, which I think encompasses some of the point Stuart was making about not legislating into the details of the technology, but establishing expectations and standards that protect consumers broadly, and then enabling the regulation to enforce that in a way, or the regulator to enforce that in a way that adapts to the very fast-paced, fast-moving uh, shape of the technology. The flip side of that, of course, is that it establishes some uncertainty for the industry um, on how to create their practices initially without knowing exactly how those are going to be interpreted or what will be considered reasonable um, in those various contexts. On the other end, of course, there's legislation, which uh, I would agree absolutely in, in many of these cases tends to be um, useless if it's overly prescriptive, outdated before it even gets passed, uh, and, and can, in fact, increase um, the burden in a way which benefits neither innovation, industry, or consumers uh, in the long run. Uh, one last comment on the paper itself and the points it makes is that it um, wraps up with a concept of a do no harm framework on regulatory action that, you know, by, by withholding action, uh, we are at least leaving the market free to either have market failure and market solution or do whatever else might be the case. Uh, and I would argue strongly that, that failure to act is not necessarily doing no harm. It's also failing to protect, and it's allowing harm that is potentially very foreseeable in certain cases, as will certainly be the case in cybersecurity um, systems. So um, sometimes a, a, a preemptive work is, in, in fact, essential. So where does our, where, where do we fall in all of this um, on the privacy question of how that integrates into whether it's the costs or the regulation of implementing all of these fabulous new technologies, which are very um, exciting and beneficial for consumers in many ways. I have my iPhone, I'm wearing my Fitbit, I have my Kindle and my bag behind me. So um, all in with the gadgets. But I also want the protections that a strong privacy framework can provide uh, from different providers, and I can't always do that as an individual consumer just acting in the market. Um, privacy can be entirely consistent with the drive for innovation. It was not at all clear when the internet started um, that it was in fact going to be a usable place for a strong commerce market. And the development of open architecture had many concerns up front, which led people to develop um, the SSL and now TLS systems to provide that security. 
the adoption of the HTTPS is what really allowed for the explosion of broad scale e-commerce and made that such a benefit that it is today for all of us. Uh, and those kind of standards and protocols are in fact necessary for the protection of consumers, for the safe business practices of the, of the industry. Uh, likewise, the ability to share communications and sensitive data across the internet has not always been something that we could take for granted and was developing, particularly when the internet moved to the mobile platforms in 2007, 2008 timeframe, particularly with the advent of smartphones and later tablets. And now much of the internet economy happens and the internet sharing of information happens on mobile devices. Um, those had to be protected as well. One of the things that has made the 5G system so successful and so much more useful is the in, uh, intensely better security that it provides for the sharing of data uh, and the sharing of information. Um, none of this is gonna stop. We're moving into a world of more connected devices, security issues that Stuart addressed, um, driverless cars. We are gonna have digital identity, digital signatures um, as more and more of our representation of our online personas and profiles as we move forward. So the idea that these things need to be designed, built and developed with some level of privacy and protection um, is to me just a given. The FTC's role at a minimum to this point has been, as was pointed out in the last panel, um, to enforce promises, to co hold companies accountable to enforce their promises. So if they say they're going to do something to make sure that they have in fact done it and that they have not in fact not done things or done things that they said they were not gonna do. Um, that is something the consumer cannot always protect themselves from directly or even in group. And uh, that is a, a, not a version of a gotcha regulatory role that seems both predictable and certain <laughs> for industry to deal with. Um, similarly, the FCC in the past has taken action against wireless carriers when they leaked sensitive data. Um, that's the kind of data that enables ID theft. It uh, is the kind that most directly supports um, uh, profiling, and that allows the exploitation, particularly of vulnerable populations, potentially the elderly or others who are not sophisticated parties in the online environment. Um, there have to be significant penalties or fines in order to hold those people, the companies, accountable and to enforce the systems that protect that data and make that something that is a priority for them. Um, we are seeing now with the uh, imminent implementation of GDPR in Europe that companies are in fact scrambling to um, put processes in place, review contracts, and do the other things to be in compliance with that. Um, this is not a defense of GDPR, but just a comment that um, the, uh, some of the larger companies that we talked to have said that in, in fact one of the benefits of this process of seeking compliance has been that they have finally, in their words, this is privacy uh, enforcement folks within the companies, gotten the full attention and um, resources that they need to do what they have felt is their appropriate job all along in providing the goods and services in a way that protect um, client or user or customer information. Um, so as we move forward again further with additional devices like cameras, VR systems, increased wearables, and particularly into environments like smart cities where we're going to be seeing more machine learning and AI processes in place, the idea that these need to be designed with private, what's called privacy by design or privacy by default um, seems to be critical. In terms of the sharing economy itself, um, I have to just say I love the term the sharing economy. Um, when we teach our children to share, we don't actually teach them to expect payment for what they just loaned their fellow toddler. <laughs> but, um, you know, we it, should change that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it makes for a, a nice, friendly title. And, I, and I'm all in favor of what is known as the sharing economy, um, which is really a micro selling economy. Um, in addition to Uber and eBay and the big ones, we have uh, more commercial versions of it in bike share, zip cars, parking meters with, that are controlled by apps. Um, you have the review processes on Amazon and Yelp and things like that, which are, are arguably part of that uh, consumer based sharing system, um, and of course Craigslist. In all of these, we have a number of unsophisticated parties that are part of this, which is why uh, protocols and standards of some kind, whether they're industry-driven, user-driven, or regulatory 
um, nudged is, is important. Um, FPF wrote a paper a couple of years ago, which was still fairly early in the sharing economy timeframe, on the way to build trust in these systems, which is based on the reputation of the participants. And as Gus pointed out, being able to rate the driver, the driver can rate the passenger, um, that's the kind of feedback that is an open model that provides clear transparency. Uh, it does carry some of its own risks. Uber, of course, as the, at the corporate level, was misusing that data and not protecting that data appropriately. Um, there are ways to do that in um, more protected formats. Uh, Airbnb has a rating system that forces both parties to post their rating before displaying either one in order to avoid um, gaming with each other. Um, and Craigslist has things like protecting uh, double-blind emails so that neither party sees the other email or can connect directly. So um, I'm going to wrap up as I'm out of time, but there are uh, many potential opportunities here. There's a lot of, I think, middle ground between the um, complete startup of the sharing economy and the entrenched interests of the industry. Um, one of Gus's examples was, you know, we, it wasn't built with, the, Airbnb wasn't built with the design of people starting little mini hotels, but in fact that's what happened in some cases. And so there are some externalization of costs on neighbors and neighborhoods and other um, factors that certainly deserve to be taken into account as well. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. And uh, we'll wrap up the initial discussion with Alan. Thanks. <clears throat> um, as Sandra mentioned, <coughs> and I just want to thank, uh, echo Brenda's thanks to uh, George Mason and everyone uh, on the panel for having me here for this discussion. Um, I'm from the Electronic Privacy Information Center, so uh, when I come to a discussion like this about the 21st century business models and 20th century regulation, I'm speaking from the perspective of an organization that's dedicated to protecting consumers, in particular protecting consumer privacy. And as the comments, I think, in this discussion uh, reveal, and also, uh, as Brenda mentioned, questions in the previous panel discussion, uh, there's multiple dimensions to that. Uh, and one of the dimensions that we're, we've been talking about is, is security, and I'm going to talk a bit about that with respect to IoT. Um, but another dimension of that is just privacy strictly, not security. The privacy of information about consumers and how that that privacy is managed, and also what happens to consumer data in the marketplace. So I'm going to take a minute and just start at the beginning where the paper starts, which is with the internet and the regulation or non-regulation of the internet, and just say a few things about that. But at the outset, I would also note that we've, we're talking a lot about innovation here, and I think it's an important question to ask as we talk about innovation of what type of innovation is it that we want. So just to give two quick examples. Uh, many of you have probably noticed before, unless you've installed an ad blocker, that if you go on the internet and you shop for a uh, certain type of food or a certain type of clothing, then, then you go on a different part of the internet, or that'll be a Facebook or some other website, oh, all of a sudden you're getting ads about the thing that you were looking for in a completely unrelated place, right? That's an advertising innovation. Good innovation? I don't know. From the consumer's perspective, I think most consumers would agree that it's not a good innovation, but it's certainly <coughs> innovative in, in a sense. A different type of innovation. We've talked a little bit about iPhones, uh, Android smartphones, uh, and, and the earlier panel was mentioned that when these devices were first uh, starting to be rolled out, there were a lot of security issues, a lot of leakage of personal information. A lot of that has changed. We've seen, for example, in the new iterations of these uh, hardware and software systems, that there are secure operating environments that will facilitate um, the protection of communication, private communications, private credentials, private financial, and, and health information. That's an innovation that directly serves the interests of the consumers. So innovation itself is not, not neutral, and there are different types of innovations. Just note that. Um, to, to start at the beginning, as I mentioned, with the, the regulation or non-regulation of the internet, I feel that one thing that's not really engaged with in the paper is the fact that there's a little bit of uh, uh, moving the goalposts or playing the game of Charlie Brown and the football going on here, <laughs> which is basically saying that uh, the internet's not, hasn't been regulated from the outset, that's great. Oh, but the FTC engages in this consent decree process and, and reviewing privacy and security practices, that's bad. I think we need to dial it back a little bit and realize that the FTC consent decree model 
was the proposed preference of the digital advertising industry and other industry players as opposed to the alternative, which was going to be a federal law that regulated the collection and of personal information. We got that for children, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, and Congress was actually in the process of developing and about to pass a similar regulation for not children, uh, didn't pass in part because um, 9-11 sucked the wind out of the room in Congress and the t attention shifted. But instead, what we got um, was what the industry wanted, which was a system of in strictly enforcing promises under the FTC's uh, deception authority and not an overarching system in the internet reg directly regulating the collection and use and, and disclosure of personal information. So we're in a, the world of supposed non-regulation. There is a regulatory body in that world, that's the FTC. They have had the authority to enforce, bring enforcement actions on fraud in the marketplace for 100 years. So it's not a new regulation that's been adopted in response to technology. It is an old system that's been imposed on technology. But it was done so at the behest of industry. So just note that. Um, another, I think, a little bit of privacy amnesia that we sometimes have is that there's this concept that privacy uh, consumer privacy is some weird European thing that we don't believe in in America, but actually the, that concept that's being imposed in Europe in the general data protection regulation that Brenda noted grew out of a set of principles that was developed here in the United States and, and developed building off the body of privacy law that developed in the, in the beginning half of the 20th century and then from the review by, uh, through the Hugh Report and the development of the Privacy Act in the 1970s, uh, which also was in the process of being imposed on the commercial sector. The Privacy Act only regulates the government. Um, but that was set aside for, for uh, a number of decades. Um, so we have instead in the United States a series of individual industry specific, sometimes technology specific privacy laws. And we can talk about the benefits or not benefits of that, but one result, as I noted, of the non-regulation of, of privacy on the internet is what was noted on the, in the question, one of the last questions for the panel earlier, which is the fact that in a lot of contexts, what consumers are left with is a vague or not vague disclosure buried somewhere in a long terms of services document that says something that the consumer hasn't read. Uh, that justifies or, or disclaims activities that the business is going to take that the consumer may not even be aware of. Um, and, and this is the world of non-regulation. So I don't think that the non-regulation of the internet in that sense has redounded to the benefit of consumers with respect to the collection, use, and, and disclosure of their personal information. But the question we're shifting over to now and, and the issue that, that Stuart and Brenda, dis, uh, or Brenda met, noted and Stuart discussed is what to do looking forward with some of the new technologies that are coming onto the marketplace now. And one of those, or a subset of those that Stuart mentioned, is connected devices or the internet of things. So we have the internet, we have computers, um, and now we put them together and we make them tiny and we put them in everything. And the question is, what happens next? Um, we'll find out. And as Stuart noted, there are a lot of problems with this system. Uh, Notably that these devices are in, very inexpensive and developed as such with limited security capability. And at the same time, there's sort of a digital arms race out there in the government sector, in the private sector, in sort of the gray and black markets uh, of how to take advantage of the vulnerabilities of these devices. Um, and these devices are increasingly vulnerable as a result of the, the architecture of the systems that they are built on. And so the question is, what, do, what should we do about that in terms of either regulating them, not regulating them, um, or creating rules, or otherwise finding ways to shape how those devices are going to exist in five years or 10 years? Um, I think that one way that we've dealt traditionally in this country dealt with market failures, external costs that are not um, immediately uh, understood in a transaction, like when I go to the store to buy uh, an Amazon Alexa or, when I, or, or a security camera, is to deal with it through liability rules. Um, another thing I'll note about the paper is that a, a related point about this moving of the goalposts in this game of kind of move, pulling the football away is that 
the paper seems to imply that the FTC enforcement system is bad because it doesn't involve judicial review. But I'll just note that um, I was up here on this stage a week ago talking about uh, a different area of privacy and regulation, which is the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, in which it was conveyed to me that judicial review was very bad. We don't want judicial review at all because we don't, companies don't want to be in court potentially liable for the impact of their business practices. But in the IoT context, I think that is what we're grappling with. How much liability to impose and how to impose it. Um, I've actually written a paper about whether the, the traditional product liability model that's been used in many different industries could be brought to bear in the Internet of Things industry. Um, and just a couple of quick points I'll make on that um, as I wrap up. And that is that that model is designed to solve a very similar problem, which is how do you deal with manufacturers and uh, manufacturing and, and commercial chain that results in the delivery of products to consumers that may have inherent uh, defects that threaten them that they are not aware of, and how to enforce through that, that commercial chain um, some need or, or impetus to develop uh, better and, and less dangerous products. Um, I think that in that context, holding companies liable for their products when they are vulnerable or become vulnerable can be a strong tool. Um, it's a more neutral tool that doesn't involve, um, let's say, necessarily the enforcement of a, of a government regulator. Um, but I think that companies may not be happy with that as, as an outcome. So I think that that's, you know, as, as a starting point of conversation, I think it's, it's just one more point to consider in the the range of regulatory options as we think about these problems. Thanks, Alan. Uh, before uh, we get into discussion with the audience, um, and before I use my moderator's privilege to ask questions that I have, um, I want to give uh, Gus and Stuart an opportunity to respond to the Good comments time. that Brendan, uh, Brenda and Alan made. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, thank you. Um, a lot of really interesting thoughts and comments. I want to pick up where uh, Alan has taken us, because I think that it's um, kind of the crux of the issue that both uh, Stuart and I and uh, this component of the uh, regulatory transparency uh, project effort really have been uh, uh, focusing, which is how should we think about regulation in these evolving, innovative 20th century, 21st, 20th century, 21st century uh, um, business models? Um, uh, and it's hard. There are uh, legal challenges that we face in applying standard legal tools um, in these markets. And some of these markets are, frankly, designed to take advantage of that. Um, so one of the uh, things that uh, the Internet of Things discussion and the sharing economy discussion have in common is it is difficult to impose liability on bad actors, or it can be difficult to impose liability on bad actors. So in the Internet of Things context, um, uh, and cybersecurity more generally, uh, there are massive supply chain problems. Uh, Stuart speaks about the example of Target. Uh, Target had pretty decent security, but it was one of their vendors that was the vector through which um, uh, an attacker was able to compromise their systems. Um, and that vendor didn't have as good security. And actually, if you look at most major cybersecurity incidents over the last decade or so, it's typically a vendor, a subcontractor, someone brought into the system um, who creates the exploit. And it's legally difficult at times to go after those vendors, especially especially when you're uh, uh, in a broader ecosystem where it might not even be the vendor who had a problem, but the vendor purchased some uh, software component from a seemingly legitimate company who had skimped a little bit uh, on some security feature, um, and uh, that allowed them to get in. Well, is it the vendor's fault? Is it the software developer's fault? Um, is it uh, the industry association who developed the standard that the software uh, was supposed to be compliant with's fault? Uh, it becomes very difficult to establish liability. Um, and I'll, I'll quickly, I, I don't think he's here anymore, so I can say this without needing to worry about a, a response.
response, uh, um, uh, David Vladek. Uh, he, I think, uh, mischaracterized in our last panel the uh, research on um, the damages attributable to data breach incidents. Um, certainly for very large companies, it's the case that um, the cost of better security um, might outweigh the uh, uh, harm to consumers, so they don't have an incentive to uh, um, uh, take good security precautions. But for uh, the vast majority of businesses in the United States, it's actually exactly reversed. The RAND data, the RAND studies that he cited to, uh, actually show potential, uh, sub potentially substantial uh, liability for most, especially small businesses, which can dwarf the value of the enterprise as a whole. Um, and adding to that, so they have an incentive in principle to um, uh, uh, put in place better security. The problem isn't the damages. The problem is legal liability. It's proven exceptionally difficult to bring civil suits uh, in order to uh, um, recover damages when they occur. Uh, so again, it's not quite a supply chain issue, but it's an issue where in this innovative area, the law hasn't caught up in a way that allows um, harm parties to uh, uh, seek redress in the courts. Um, and same thing to a slightly, not a lesser extent, to a different uh, uh, extent um, with the sharing economy. One of the big discussions about the sharing economy, uh, the way that I characterized it, the way I discussed it, it was this happy unicorn story about all of these consumers with Slack resources who are able to come together uh, and uh, make a market, putting those Slack resources to productive use. Well, the reality is for many people, the sharing economy is a great way for fly-by-night organizations to engage in regulatory arbitrage, avoiding the laws that are put in place to protect consumers. Um, and and what is this about? Well, it's when I, the consumer, get hurt by my Airbnb driver. Do I sue Airbnb? Oh, no, he's just a contractor. You can't sue Airbnb. You need to sue the driver. Well, what was his name? How do I find them? It's a little hard to do that. Oh, and he's completely judgment proof. So um, uh, my ability to uh, uh, rely on civil recourse there uh, is limited. I'm a lawyer. We're all lawyers for the most part. I like suing people. I think when people do bad things, they should get sued. This is essential in order to align incentives. And very frequently in these markets, those incentives are misaligned. So the question implicitly that uh, uh, Alan uh, 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 frames up for us and that we're struggling with in this project is when we have these dynamic markets that are breaking the standard legal mechanisms that we rely on to align incentives, do we say, regulate. We need to come in and protect the consumers with a, a, a top-down regulation that says, uh, sharing economy entity, you're doing bad stuff, bad on you. Um, or should we wait f uh, for common law mechanisms to evolve or perhaps have a more uh, narrowly tailored um, uh, statutory uh, changes in uh, rules of evidence, rules of uh, wh whatever rules they're going to be in order to allow standard civil legal uh, uh, mechanisms to work. And I'll, I'll uh, add, um, so for those who are not familiar with it, GDPR, worst thing ever except one of the things that the GDPR does, which I think is really essential in this area, um, in the, the European language, um, data controllers are liable for the security of their data processors. In US terms, uh, under the new European regulation, uh, uh, this means if uh, you have data and you have a vendor that comes in to work with it, uh, the, the person who controls the data is uh, uh, liable to make sure that their subcontractors have good security. And that's addressing these supply chain uh, problems. And I think that's a really important thing, not because it's top-down prescriptive regulation, but because it's a step that allows the uh, traditional uh, civil legal remedies to work. Thanks. Uh, Stuart, do you want to comment? Sure. At, at, in the interest of sparking controversy, uh, uh, I'll, I'll take on some of the privacy issues. Uh, uh, I care a lot about security. Uh, I have never seen a security measure in cyberspace that was proposed that wasn't opposed by uh, the privacy groups represented up here, among others. Uh, uh, they are uh, their fascination with privacy has blinded them to the real needs, which is a security of data. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, um, uh, but Alan 
mentioned that uh, the right to privacy was invented in the United States. Uh, uh, Louis Brandeis wrote that famous article about the right to privacy. Uh, um, and I think, in fact, that it is the original sin of privacy campaigners everywhere um, uh, that uh, uh, you can trace the roots of their movement back to that article. And I would only urge you to go back and read it. Uh, uh, when I talk about this in, in detail, I, I ask the question right from the start, uh, Louis Brandeis, snob or wuss? Uh, uh, because he spends all of his time complaining about new technology that enables people, without his permission, to take his picture. Who do they think they are, these lower class people? Publishing his picture, talking gossip about his wife's parties. Uh, uh, they have better things to do. They should be improving their minds the way Louis Brandeis does. Uh, uh, and uh, his the, the pain he suffers from knowing that his picture has been taken and that his nose does not look the way he thought it did uh, is staggering, uh, and that's the harm. And he has foisted on the United States, we still have this, uh, uh, a set of rules that say um, your image is protected. People can't take your image. Now, you might be surprised to hear that, having seen all those photos of your nose in, uh, 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 the, in Instagram and other places. Uh, uh, it turns out that the law, uh, since we all are used to now the idea that everybody's going to take our picture, the law only has turned out to protect people who are selling their privacy, celebrities who can monetize it. Uh, um, and this is, the f this is the fate of all privacy laws. They are be they begin based on a sense of creepiness. Oh, this ad, it's following me around the internet. Um, isn't that creepy? Uh, and in an effort to prevent that, we write laws that uh, make it hard to do that. And then by the time the laws actually take effect, we've gotten used to it. You know, it's no big deal. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's because I looked at that transaction up. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll go back there. This is kind of handy. Um, a, but uh, it's now illegal. It's illegal for everybody, even though most of us are quite used to it. Uh, you remember that all those uh, uh, lawsuits in which the police said, I can't believe you're recording me while I'm doing my job. That's a felony, and it is a felony. And you know why it's a felony? Thanks to privacy campaigners who said that uh, any conversation should be private unless both parties agree that the conversation will not be private. Uh, and since you're taking recordings of the police without the pol permission of the police, it's a felony. Thank you, privacy groups. Um, it's, all of these problems, I think, can be traced back to the fact that we're regulating creepiness. And by the time the regulations take effect, it ain't creepy anymore. Uh, and then the, the, the laws that we've passed end up serving some powerful person like a police chief uh, in unanticipated uh, uh, circumstances. Um, so this is why I have a problem with, uh, with privacy uh, laws. I would also just let's uh, say this about uh, regulation uh, aimed at the internet. If you're going to regulate technology, you can't just say the technology will not do what the technology does. You don't say, we're having a lot of people die in traffic a uh, accidents, and we didn't have that when we were using horse-drawn carts. So let's just tell the automobiles they can't go faster than a horse-drawn horse cart. You have to find new mechanisms that go with the technology as opposed to try to stand in its path. Uh, you need uh, licensing. You need uh, both on the cars and on the people who do it. Uh, uh, and this is also true with the kinds of information technology that we're using today. If you want security, you're not going to say, well, don't give people your information. You're going to try to use that information in order to enforce the norms that you want to enforce. And, and, and Brenda said this, reputation is, is the key uh, regulator of behavior in many of these apps. It's the fact that we can find 
the guy who drove us uh, uh, six months ago if we have to, uh, because that information is still hanging around, that gives us a little more confidence that we aren't gonna get ripped off uh, uh, when we get in the car. Um, using more information, the fact that there is vast amounts of information, can also be used to find the hackers, to attribute the attacks, uh, uh, to track them down and to uh, prosecute them. Uh, uh, if we build technology that fosters attribution and that devalues anonymity on the internet. So right there, it's a great way to move forward using the inherent nature of the technology in order to provide better security. I guarantee you that nobody to the left of me is going to say that's a good idea. Uh, and this is my fundamental problem with privacy. I think we're, we're you know, protecting the wussiest aspects of our own nature at a cost of the actual security of our data. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think you've raised some very interesting uh, ideas. And actually, I'll try and uh, package them together and ask a question myself, and then ask all of you to sort of go at it um, and respond. Um, as I read the paper, <clears throat> I had reactions to it that uh, you've all echoed in some way or another. Um, and I guess I come at these issues not so much from the uh, privacy space, but working in the intellectual property world. Um, I think about these issues a lot, and you know, you think about this concept of maybe internet, you know, exceptionalism that has uh, grown up. That you know, you can't regulate the internet in any respect. Um, and some would argue that the internet, uh, we're not talking about regulating the internet, um, but rather that you know, the internet is already entirely lawless, that in various respects there are safe harbors in laws that are passed to regulate uh, society in every other respect. Uh, when we pass a law, say in the intellectual property space or in the communication space, there is a safe harbor for internet service providers, for platforms, uh, so there's no liability. So if there's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, there's a safe harbor for internet service providers. In the Communications Decency Act, there's a safe harbor for internet service providers. And so there are all sorts of entirely illegal businesses that have sprung up on the internet. Um, and uh, you know everything from IP theft to sex trafficking to identity theft to black markets and so forth have sprung up, and now we even have the uh, uh, CEOs in Silicon Valley wringing their hands uh, over the fact that their platforms are being used in ways that they never anticipated. So um, I guess I would I would ask. Um, you know, Stuart, maybe to to go a little bit further about your uh, your idea um, it, uh, about looking at consumer data and uh, you know consumer identity data. Um, I think one problem is, uh, on the one hand, consumers have actually no property rights in their data. They can't take it with them. They can't take it away from any of these platforms. Um, and on the other hand, uh, uh, looking at what Gus was uh, talking about, the opportunity to, you know, to sue people uh, who do you harm, um, there are all these safe harbors. And so there's no, no opportunity to actually enforce your rights, even if you had a property right in your identity. Uh, so how do we, how do we uh, deal with these issues? Well, I am, I am struck uh, by your analogy, uh, by the extent to which the MPI, MPAA and RIAA uh, uh, approach um, is exactly the, the, the approach that EPIC and the Future of Privacy uh, Forum uh, are inclined to, which is this data is being, is, is just out there. Our songs are just 
gone out into the internet and are being copied. Uh, our data is places we don't know where it's gone. Well, yeah, get used to it. This is the world we're in. Uh, and uh, the RIAA did try suing everybody, uh, and it did not work out so well. Uh, I, so I'm not convinced that suing people when the data, which gets cheaper to process and to store and to uh, analyze every year, the, the, trying to say, oh, we want to make it more expensive. We want to tell people not to process, not to share, not to uh, use that data. It, that, that, is, that is like saying, yes, you should drive no faster than a, a horse-drawn cart. Uh, so I just don't think that's the way to approach the problem. I, I, if you're worried about particular consequences, you ought to identify the consequences and try to prevent those consequences from occurring, as opposed to just saying, I don't like my data out there. So first, I think Stuart has a title for a, a new paper, um, uh, Louis Brandeis, uh, Wussy Snob or Snobby Wuss. Um, uh, so I, I, I like the framing of thinking about this more broadly in terms of other internet safe harbors that we have. And you're right, one of the weird things about the internet is we have all sorts of safe harbors. And I have sympathies for many of the safe harbors, but I think that they all tend to go too far. And this brings me back to one of the core issues with the sharing economy, which I think we need to really struggle with in a way that we haven't before. One of the realities of the sharing economy, and Brenda brought this point up, um, Airbnb is primarily nowadays used for consumers to find people who are operating as businesses who are, or actually who are businesses. I don't think I have had an Uber driver in the last year who wasn't a full-time Uber driver, where they weren't actually doing this as a business. Um, so one of the transitions that we see with sharing economy platforms is they go from consumer to consumer platforms, uh, where we're trying to find stuff in this long tail of economic activity and make it economically possible, um, to a new platform for ordinary business to consumer um, uh, uh, businesses to operate. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. That's not a bad thing at all. Rather, what these platforms become is a new way for people to get into the market, a new way for innovative businesses to form, a, a way for uh, entrepreneurs to develop reputational capital um, and develop into a, a more traditional business. The question is, how do we manage this transition from consumer to consumer where we're going to understandably have a, 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 a different set of rules, a lower regulatory environment to business to consumer, where be it through a, a civil litigation, a civil liability, or a regulatory backstops, we're going to be operating in a more heavily regulated uh, environment. The concern is if we see all of the uh, business scale uh, 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 concerns out there and say, oh my god, we need to regulate because Airbnb, this is really just people running unlicensed hotels. Um, or to uh, 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 take Sandra's point uh, um, more broadly, um, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, uh, if we say, uh, wow, there's all this bad stuff going on on Facebook and Backpage. We have to regulate these platforms to cut off um, uh, all of this uh, Russian interference and uh, 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 sex trafficking. It's clearly problematic. We have to regulate. Well, yes, these are the big established players, and there might be some reason to regulate them in some ways. Um, I'm not generally a proponent of regulation, and I wouldn't say, whole hog, let's regulate them. But I understand, yes, there are reasons to regulate. The concern is, where's the baby in the bathwater? Um, if we say Section 230, we're going to start allowing more regulation, we're going to uh, uh, do away with the safe harbor, what about the small companies? What about the companies that are more consumer to consumer? They're just uh, trying to get some innovative ideas out there into the market uh, where the problems aren't going to come uh, into play until they're operating at scale. Um, and that transition is something that uh, the law has not done a good job adapting to um, and understanding. Uh, Brenda or Ellen, do you want to comment on sure. these issues? Um, I'd like to thank Stuart, because I think this is the first time, at least in my three and a half years at FPF, that FPF and Epic have ever been co-located in the same bucket, sharing the same uh, 
uh, <laughs> set of priorities that may never happen again, but um, I'll take it for the moment. Um, so just some comments in general about the privacy interests, and um, I would acknowledge completely the characterization of, of Brandeis's paper as entirely accurate and um, being very annoyed that people were taking pictures through his um, open drawing room drapes uh, into the parties that were being held at his house. Um, that is, in fact, entirely where it all started. Um, but here we are. And so whether we have a privacy interest now in our data and how it's being used, I think, is more than just our wussiness or potentially our snobbishness um, in that regard. I would say that, for example, Stuart, if you had ever been married to a really large man who beat you, that you might, in fact, have some privacy interests in um, your phone or your Uber app when you used it to get away, or if you rented a zip car, in that information not being easily accessible, or your geolocation not being able to be reflected um, easily to someone who might be coming after you. Um, if, in fact, uh, individuals have relationships that end badly and are the subject of uh, revenge porn or stalking or other sorts of, um, in fact, physical harm threats to themselves as well as emotional or financial or uh, other kinds of issues like that, that there are some safety concerns that I think are legitimately addressed by some privacy issues over um, what can be done with their information, their photo, their data. Um, is that going to prevent all of that from happening? Absolutely not. But is it going to uh, establish some standards, hold some of the platforms to um, positions to minimize it, correct it, take it down to the extent when they can? And um, as Gus has pointed out, perhaps establish some clear lines of liability and uh, either civil or criminal consequences for either the people at fault or the um, platforms or the tools that they use for that. Uh, the integral part of, the, of a privacy priority is not simply to keep your information secret or just to have um, personal, complete, and total control at all times over that information. Uh, the basics of the privacy principles at issue, which Alan alluded to, that have been around for decades prior to the internet, in fact, um, include things like access rights, um, being able to see what data someone holds on you, um, to challenge it, to make corrections to it when it's wrong, to hold companies accountable for its accuracy when it's being used to make decisions about you personally, whether it's a loan or a um, sale of a house or a car or anything else, um, and to have the rights to delete that in relationships that you no longer wish to be in with a commercial entity. Um, those are all, I think, reasonable demands on the control and use of your data, the responsible relationship that you and that company have um, regarding your use. Even though we don't limit cars to driving um, at the speed of horses, we also don't let cars drive as fast as they possibly can at all times. Um, I, for one, would not be entirely opposed to that. but. Um, it is not reasonable, it's not um, safe and efficient. We have um, traffic limits that are not based on any one factor. Sometimes it's the nature of the uh, environment, like a residential neighborhood or near a school. Sometimes it's the um, size and capacity of the road, um, the amount of traffic it carries. And we have a, a number of ways to influence people's behavior in that by design integral to residential roads that are being built now with um, speed re restricting factors in terms of um, medians, narrowing, things like that that can influence behavior um, beyond just setting a speed limit or having to have a police officer enforce that. Um, driverless cars may make a lot of that moot, but that is nevertheless the process that we have and that we're in at the moment. Um, I think when we ignore, ignore is probably the wrong word, when we dismiss uh, some of the privacy concerns too easily, um, we also disregard the fact that these are critically important to a lot of people. And as we are seeing with the GDPR, which um, I won't necessarily call the worst thing ever, but I will agree with Gus is, is at least um, uh, an overreaction or an overstatement in many ways of a way to regulate privacy. There are nevertheless many, many of the major companies that we all deal with that are not apparently going to stop operating in Europe just because of it, which means they are making these changes and having to adapt to the privacy demands of the law there. 
And so either we cede the discussion to the EU regulators in terms of both the passing of the law and the interpretation of its application and enforcement, or we join that conversation in a way that perhaps pulls it back a little more to the standards and, and reasonable data practices that we think um, would be applicable. Uh, the worst case variation of that, of course, is that we do lose services. Um, we have seen, uh, there's a biometrics law in, in Illinois called BIPA that allows for a private right of action, which is fairly unusual under a lot of privacy laws. And um, because of that, there are a number of cases in the courts right now there against um, both companies, large and small, that use any kind of biometric information. And in fact, we have now seen recently the, the um, lack of availability of certain products and services to consumers in Illinois simply because of concerns about the enforcement or the litigation risks uh, involved in doing business there. Uh, and I don't think that any of us want that as well. So these are the, con these are the concepts that are behind our interests in working with industry uh, and with thoughtful advocates and academics who um, consider these problems and try to find ways to address them as the technologies are being developed and rolled out. If I can quickly just add a, well, one other example to what Brenda was saying. Um, Facebook is uh, working on a technology to help identify uh, individuals who are likely to harm themselves or commit suicide. And they've recently said they're not going to offer that uh, uh, functionality in Europe because of the GDPR. So the, the privacy interests can cut both ways. Thanks. And Alan? Thanks. <clears throat> um, just to respond to a few points that were raised quickly. Um, I think one thing we're dealing with here in the course of this conversation is an uncertainty as to what the core goal is. In the beginning, we were talking about promoting innovation, um, but up until the point where you know Stuart was talking about uh, the Brandeis article and the application of privacy law in the U.S. and when where what where companies just go and what they do and whether or not we should regulate. Uh, car speed, um, I thought we were advocating for different forms of regulatory models, but now it sounds like we're debating between not having laws, not regulating legally anything, whether it's in court under common law torts, which is what privacy laws are, uh, based on the Brandeis article, or um, under specific state statutes, which are what um, speed limit laws are, or under federal statutes, which are what um, both the privacy, sectoral privacy laws we have are and but also the sectoral uh, liability shields that you mentioned. So <clears throat> first of all, I don't think anyone except maybe Stuart on this panel is advocating lawlessness. Um, and so the question is, what are the rules? How do we apply them in a technology neutral way? And how do they impact individuals? And I think that uh, ultimately, people do and should have rights maybe not immediately akin to property rights, but some degree of rights and information about them, and that includes photographs and how their names are used. Um, and the, the sort of original, one of the original sins of this non-regulation of the internet, I think, is that, and this was mentioned, as I mentioned on the earlier panel, is this concept that we disclaim these rights merely by going to places and reading things, right? If you were, uh, uh, told to believe that if you browse to pets.com, pets.com now owns your house as a result of you opening their web page because somewhere in a terms of service somewhere it says if you load this web page we now own your house. That would be pretty absurd, right? I think we would all agree that that would be an insane situation. Um, and yet when it comes to your personal information, that's how it's treated. Um, there's a really good, we're not going to be able to sort of engage in this at length in this, in this discussion, but back to the point about um, personal information and whether it is or is not such a bad thing that it is being widely disseminated or their entire markets of people sort of building databases and trading personal information. There's a really good uh, TED talk called uh, We're Building a Dystopia just to get people to click on ads. And I think it raises the, the, the point that like why are, what, what are we, what value are we promoting in these systems? Um, I also think that if you build, I think the Brandeis article, um, Accur somewhat accurately characterized in terms of the technology he was reacting to was very prophetic in terms of seeing the potential 
outcomes of the developments of new technologies and their integration into society. And we don't live in a world where after the Brandeis article, we never had privacy torts or privacy law. So we live in a world that is the result of that article and the torts that developed over the following 50 years and the laws that we've developed since then. So I don't think we can posit what the world would look like if we had never done any of those things. But quick, just a quick other point on the, the issue you raised about liability shield. Um, if the, there is a concern that Gus voiced earlier that laws can be can cause or be the result of regulatory or congressional legislative capture and can affect market power in significant ways, for example, by creating or supporting oligopoly or monopoly power, um, look around at the largest market capital companies in the world right now and notice that most of them benefit directly from Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And we have created systems of market power as a result of a federal law that was passed in the 1990s to promote the deregulation of the internet. So it's not such a simple story. And one other point I'll make about Section 230 and back to the Brandeis article is that one of the problems we're grappling with right now, for just as an example of a privacy issue that's, that's discreet and everyone can understand, is the problem of the posting and distribution non-consensually of nude images on the internet. And Every, almost every state in the country has, in the last five years, passed some form of law to attempt to deal with this problem, which is a real problem that affects real people and can lead to real consequences, like suicide. And almost every one, single one of those laws has a carve out for companies that fit the description of Section 230 of the, of the Communications Decency Act. Those companies cannot be touched by these state laws that regulate a practice that directly impacts people's lives. So I think it's worth considering, um, again, it's not as clean as regulation bad affects innovation and market power, non-regulation good. Sometimes we have non-regulation in the form of sector-specific liability shields that impact both impact market power and impact the ability of individuals to seek redress. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll make one other comment maybe along the lines um, uh, of, uh, uh, of where um, Gus started out his comments um, about the sharing economy, um, and that is, uh, you know, you talk about how regulations um, can be used to keep people, you know, out of the labor market. They're used, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, require people to take licenses and, you know, uh, create cartels and, uh, and you know. That's reinforced by lobbying and you know putting uh, money and, and so forth back into the political marketplace. Um, but you know you can call it the sharing uh, economy, but some people also call it you know the gig economy, right? Because what you see happening um, in the sharing economy is that uh, some of the effect is that the competition with hotels or with cabs or so forth. Um, has actually limited jobs, so people are working numerous jobs and you know losing health benefits and uh, having lower pay and so forth. So how do you respond to you know to that criticism um, and perhaps to the criticism that that uh, Alan was raising about the internet of of things uh, as well? I guess um, I'm not quite sure precisely what the criticism uh, you're, you're leveraging is. Is it the uh, transition to the gig economy where people are losing the benefits of traditional employment? Right. The, the, so if the, if the argument is that you know, the sharing economy you know, um, is a good thing and regulations are a bad thing because regulations uh, you know, keep people out of the labor market, um, the sharing economy actually is perhaps proving the opposite, that it's, uh, you know, limiting jobs um, because people are, you know, losing jobs at hotels and losing, you know, good paying jobs and they're uh, now being forced into a gig economy where they're uh, having to, you know, cobble together uh, low paying jobs and uh, mm. the companies that are creating the apps are, you know, not companies that employ a lot of people, um, as opposed so, to the companies that are going out of business. Uh, there, there are a number of uh, uh, responses. Um, 
uh, and the, the most basic uh, response is if these individuals with these traditional jobs are only able to have those jobs because of barriers to entry which are uh, creating uh, oligopolies um, that actually is harming all other consumers. Uh, so uh, 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 if more uh, people can enter the market and push down prices and have low, uh, with lower wages, that's good for the broader market. Uh, and this turns into a, a traditional um, microeconomic uh, a discussion and uh, I don't even uh, think argument. Um, uh, we shouldn't regulate the economy and harm GDP and decrease national uh, wealth in order to give a couple of people health insurance. The broader point, um, and we've seen this through a, a number of parts of this discussion, is we do have more fundamental problems. So sometimes uh, in, in response to this concern, uh, if the answer is we shouldn't allow these innovative uh, uh, companies to come into existence because we want to make sure people can have long-term stable jobs with health insurance uh, and what's not, well, the problem there in many ways has nothing to do with the sharing economy. It's our uh, uh, broken healthcare system and too high health costs uh, across a number of dimensions. And without getting into a discussion about uh, uh, the healthcare uh, market, we shouldn't regulate the uh, a sharing economy and prevent all the benefits that it potentially has in order to address some other much different, potentially much larger, potentially smaller uh, uh, set of issues. Um, same thing with a, a lot of uh, uh, privacy issues, for instance. Uh, if we're concerned about how uh, uh, markets are structured, if we're concerned about the use of information in advertising, uh, if we're concerned about uh, a lot of uh, social services and very legitimate social concerns, and privacy is exacerbating those, let's not do, in my view, crazy things on the privacy side to protect people from how their information can be used. Instead, let's address the fundamental underlying problems, which are often harder, bigger, and more intractable. Intract intractable. But uh, uh, that's where we should be focusing our attention instead of distorting the markets. Okay. Uh, so I want to make sure that we give the uh, audience an opportunity to ask questions and participate in the discussion. So. Um, if we have microphones uh, in, that we can get to folks. Is there anybody, who, there's a question right here. Uh, to the privacy advocates, I will say that um, I used to be very concerned about this and made a lot of my purchases with cash and then when the credit card companies decided they developed a business model where they would actually pay me back 2% on every purchase I made, I decided that's it, my price had been, had been met. <laughs> now, th that sort of uh, trade-off, I think, is implicit through a lot of stuff done on the internet. You've certainly given examples, nude pictures, that sort of thing, obvious torts that have to be regulated, but just in terms of using things like purchase data, where you went, sites you visited, that sort of thing. I mean, if when someone brought up Google, if there was a big statement, when you have that pretty Google front page that comes out with the funny letters and said, your uh, places you visit on Google are recorded and maybe you know, sold or provided to others without your consent. So now you can make the decision, either use Google or don't use Google, if this is of a concern to you. I mean, would that solve the problem for you with respect to that level? Um, you wanna? I'll just, I'll be brief, because I wanna hear what you say. <laughs> um, <laughs> if something flashes up and tells you that and you acknowledge it, then you have in fact consented. So that's actually one of the basics of privacy, you know, uh, practices is when and where to get what kinds of consent for different kinds of activity. And in fact, Google has a privacy policy posted somewhere um, that in fact does say that they won't sell your information or that they will only share it in these contexts or those kind of things. And you know, one of our goals is hopefully that they abide by that. And 
it is okay that not everybody reads the privacy policies. They don't not have value just because not everyone reads them. Um, I am entirely oblivious to the food health inspection standards of the beef that I buy in a hamburger package. Um, but I'm pretty sure there are some, and I don't really want to think about how many rat hairs there are allowed to be in there or anything else. <laughs> but I'm also pretty sure that I'm probably not going to become desperately ill or die if I eat it and feed it to my family. Um, and I feel like as we become more sophisticated consumers and we are interacting on the internet, those set of reasonable expectations do in fact evolve and change. We do know that if we go on Google that they're paying attention to what we're doing. And in fact, what we see is that if we go to a site like DuckDuckGo or something that doesn't, they're the ones actually really framing that and saying, you probably expect to be tracked around the internet. We're not going to do that. And here's what that means for you. And then you can make that choice as well as a consumer. Um, so that sort of transparency or understanding, I think, is, is inherent in what what I would want to have there. I think, I think transparency is part of it. I don't think, I don't personally think that uh, a general disclaimer is the same thing as consenting to sharing of your information. And I also don't think that the business practices, so you describe one type of business practice, which is a website that just collects information, and the question is whether they just po flash quickly to you right before you give it to them um, some disclaimer. Um, but the business practices are not set in stone. And if you look at um, just a couple quick examples, uh, how location data is handled by most modern services, including Google. Um, you go to search for something. Let's say you're just, you're, you're, you have a cold and you want some medicine. You search for cold medicine. Um, there's a pop frequently now a pop-up that says, oh, do you want this to be a search uh, that's dictated by your location? And you could say, no, yes, you have an option. Right? They actually give you a meaningful choice. It's not a general disclaimer. No, I don't want that. But maybe I'm looking for a restaurant in my area, and I do want that. It's easy to build the system that way, <clears throat> and I think it's reasonable to expect companies to build the system that way. And if you look at how modern phones work, um, you'll see that <clears throat> a lot of these systems are now built that actually give individuals control over what types of information they're disclosing and how it's being used. Um, another just quick example, there has been a lot of development around televisions recently. Many people who bought a TV recently might have noticed that there's all these smart features on the TV. Um, but it turned out a couple years ago that some of these companies had built a smart feature that they weren't telling everyone about, which is that they were scanning the images on your TV, and they were able to actually recognize what you were watching, and they were selling that out the back door. And a number of companies um, were raked over the coals in the public about this. They were subject to suit, investigation. And I recently purchased a Samsung TV, turned it on for the first time. It pops up to activate the smart TV features. It actually tells you, here are three different options. You can choose whether you want to turn on the feature where we're going to scan the, the images on your TV and, and sell ads based on that, or not. There's a checkbox. I unchecked that box. It's a completely reasonable uh, business practice. And it's not set in stone that the businesses must necessarily click everything or nothing, that it's either on, off, and there's no nuance whatsoever. And in fact, we're seeing more nuance now and innovation in the services that these companies provide to users. I think we have time for um, a couple additional questions. One more question. Hi, uh, Will Reinhardt. Um, this is directed to Gus. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the variability within the kind of context that exists already with some of, within some of these industries. Yeah, and so it's a small, quick, you know, quick point. Um, I think in 2006 or 2007, the tacky cab industry actually came out with a study on their own um, their own workers, and something like 85% of uh, taxi cab drivers were actually independent contractors, which most people don't recognize that in fact the entire industry was already built on this type of labor anyway. Do you think that, and I think you kind of hit on some of this, but I was just wondering if you could talk about the technologies becoming kind of a context for long-standing issues and whether or not, you know, for example, Grubhub, no one cares about, to a certain extent, no one really cares about Grubhub, but, you know, there's obviously important implications for you know, the, um, the baggers union. Do you think that it's just because that there's been longstanding contextual, you know, longstanding issues within these industries already that, that the uh, technology is kind of highlighting again that they're getting focus or is it because there's actually truly issues within 
uh, the larger uh, technology itself? I know this is a really, really broad question, but it just seems to me that the things we always care about are the things that have long existed, but we just don't really talk about them. Um, so I've not studied this in particular, which is great. It means I have an opportunity to uh, just uh, uh, spout off and speculate rampantly. Um, <laughs> my uh, intuition is, uh, I think, along the lines of what you're suggesting, um, and this follows uh, my uh, previous uh, uh, comment at some level, that there are other broader issues at play very frequently. Um, uh, and it's kind of uh, like a, a, Tom Hazlett, when he talks about uh, Ronald Coase and the FCC, the, the intuition that even though interference and scarcity are common in every industry, uh, uh, the quote he has is, interference is the opportunity. The fact that we have this high profile, everyone gets it, that spectrum is, it's different, it seems different. Even though it's not that different, it seems different. It is a focal point around which people who have particular uh, concerns uh, or particular interests can organize. Um, and the, the growth of uh, uh, the sharing economy, and especially the big players in the sharing economy, and especially uh, the uh, idiotic travails of certain CEOs uh, that lead some of those companies in the sharing economy, uh, uh, create a great deal of opportunity um, for those who are interested either in actually putting in place substantive regulation or raising more generally the concern um, uh, about uh, uh, workers' rights in another context which can be uh, transferred to broader discussions and broader concerns, uh, it's an opportunity uh, uh, to make a political point, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, in terms of differences between different uh, industries, different technologies, um, uh, there's a, a lot of reality and a lot of truth to um, uh, just basic problems, basic structural problems um, that uh, are being can be disrupted uh, by these technologies. And we are having a, um, a general discussion uh, uh, at an increased rate, I think, right now about occupational licensing um, in the United States. Both the FTC uh, and the Institute for Justice have been pushing a lot of concerns and bringing, in the case of uh, the Institute for Justice, a lot of successful uh, uh, litigation over these sort of concerns. And what is the concern about occupational licensing? Well, it's really, in many ways, the same concern that I started with when I was talking about uh, uh, the sharing economy. Uh, do we allow anyone into the market to engage in uh, uh, various occupations, or do we want to regulate them? Um, and uh, the sharing economy is just uh, uh, one of many wedges in that debate. Thank you. So I think we are at uh, time now. Um, so I ask you to help me thank the panel. <laughs> <laughs>